Thank you for the invitation. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about some of our recent work from the Harvard and Quera community uh, back over in Boston. Um, <clears throat> I slightly changed my title to also include kind of some of our recent experimental results obtained in the Harvard lab. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about kind of some of our recent efforts and perspectives um, towards control efficient quantum error correction in reconfigurable atom arrays. So as many of us are aware, um, throughout this workshop, we've seen that kind of the challenge of last scale quantum computation really requires a pretty big leap from the physical error rates that we have today in the lab to the actual error rates that are required for large scale quantum algorithms that we maybe have a little bit more confidence of having large speed ups for. So this is a massive gap and um, fortunately there's methods that have been developed, many of them pioneered by people in this audience, of using quantum error correction to actually bridge this massive gap. But at the same time, bridging this gap is not cheap at all. Um, so we don't need an exponential amount of resources, but still the amount of resources when you actually go through all of the details and count things are still pretty large. Um, for example, this, uh, I think, pretty famous analysis done by Craig Gidney and Martin Akera, um, they found that you need on the order of 20 million noisy qubits with fidelities that are actually even a little bit better than the best physical fidelities today to reach kind of these practical scales that we're more confident we can uh, see an advantage for. So this is still a very big gap um, and it would be very nice to develop methods to really bring down the costs of doing these large scale quantum computations. So in the, in the talk today, I'll be talking a little bit about our perspective on approaching this problem in perhaps a more hardware or control efficient way using the neutral atom platform. So I'll first tell you a little bit about our recent experimental results at Harvard. Um, these are kind of the logical quantum processes that we now have in our hands today, where we can have hardware efficient control of on the order of like 48 logical qubits and now start really thinking about executing some small scale early fault tolerant logical algorithms. Terry, yeah. is this paper online or? Uh, it's not quite online, but it, it, sh it should be posted relatively soon, yeah. Um, and using a lot of these ideas as well as control tools that we'll be developing and describing here, we'll then take this and think about how this can also inform us for new architectural opportunities tomorrow. In this particular case, um, we're thinking about how we can reduce the spatial overhead for a lot of these things, utilizing these uh, kind of quantum LDPC code types of ideas to hopefully have orders of magnitude reduction in the overhead that we need for large scale quantum error correction. Okay, um, so I'll jump in. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an intro, maybe slightly more on the experimental side so that we can at least know what types of controls we need to actually execute these. So the system that we have are these so-called neutral atom arrays. What we're doing is we're using individual optical tweezers here. Each individual optical tweezer traps an individual atom, um, and these atoms basically host our qubits. So the key part that I want you to kind of keep in mind here is what actually the control we're doing to, in order to mani manipulate these qubits. So in particular, one type of control that we really like are these so-called crossed acoustic optic deflectors. So these are essentially de optical devices that do the following. You have an incoming laser beam. One acoustic optic deflector will deflect this one beam into kind of an array of beams. And then if you have one in the perpendicular direction, then you'll generate kind of a square grid. One key feature of this is that you can actually move things around in parallel. You can kind of stretch and, and dilate this grid. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility for kind of doing dynamical placement and movement of your qubits during the circuit. Another important feature is that when we illustrate that kind of there's one wire going to the X and one wire going to the Y, that is literally what's happening in the lab, which means that by just controlling two wires, we're actually able to control many, many degrees of freedom in the system. And I think that's a very important feature that will also be coming back to later. The other device that we have is a spatial light modulator. This one has a much slower refresh rate, so it's essentially kind of a static grid that has arbitrary configuration, but which we kind of use as our backbone. So essentially what an experiment might look like is we first load <clears throat> a bunch of atoms into kind of a, a larger scale backbone grid. Um, these atoms are loaded somewhat stochastically, um, but then we can use 
these steerable uh, AODs to sort them into, in this particular case, a 400 atom defect free array. Okay? So we have these tools, um, and in particular, the control, again, is really only using relatively few kind of things that are going into your system, but having massive multiplexing through optics. Uh, was there a question there? Yes, so is it really two degrees of freedom for the whole system, or is that per qubit? So right now, right now, we're pretty much using just these two devices to program all of our locations and moves across everything, like all of the qubits together. But there's one of those light traps for each atom, right? Yeah, so this, each of these guys generate many light traps. Okay. So, so each atom is in one light trap, but we have many light traps, and the light traps are controlled with ha very high parallelism. But each light trap, all the light traps are controlled by one cross acousto optic deflector? Right. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. You, can, you can add more, but this is just what we currently have in the system. Okay. Yeah. And what's the lifetime? Of, so yeah, so the, the time scale that we hold on to the atoms is 10 seconds. The coherence time is also several seconds long with, with suitable decoupling. And how long does it take to load them into this defect free array? Yeah, so, so currently in our typical experimental sequences, we're running this loading for 50 to 100 milliseconds. However, this is something where in the future, for, for a variety of reasons, also such as the atom loss lifetime, we actually want to be able to continuously reload atoms. And in that case, then, this would only become a latency. You basically pipeline the thing so that you always have enough atoms, and the access time to kind of your, your newly reloaded atoms would be much shorter than this 100 milliseconds. Well, what about your poly gate time and your uh, entangling gate time? Yeah, so the, the actual physical gates, the single qubit and two qubit gate times, and maybe we'll just jump into here. Uh, maybe I'll get back to the question in a second. Um, so the, the precise encoding that we utilize is that we encode the qubits in these so-called hyperfine states. So these are relatively long-lived, so we have kind of on the order of seconds coherence time, um, and then we can have uh, relatively high fidelities either with a global beam that addresses all of the atoms, this is typically used for decoupling, or local beams such that we can do individual rotations. Um, the typical time scale of the single qubit and two qubit gates are on the order of uh, several hundred nanoseconds to maybe a microsecond or so. So the gates themselves are actually very quick. The part that can sometimes be a little bit slow is moving things around and also right now measurement. Each of these are maybe on the order of several hundred microseconds. But these are also things where either you could, there are a variety of ways of speeding up both of these. You could also imagine, for example, there are schemes where you have a little bit more local control and you actually don't move your atoms quite as frequently around. And these are techniques that are very actively being developed in the community. And probably maybe in the next one or two years, I would expect to see results from people on that as well. What's the reason the global is more, has higher fidelity than the local one? Yeah, so there are some slight atomic physics reasons because of the polarizations and selection rules that make this configuration slightly uh, more favorable. But I would say at these particular numbers, it was probably more limited by our patients in calibrating them. Yeah. OK, um, so we can also do two qubit gates now with reasonably high fidelity um, by moving these uh, moving atoms to be neighboring with each other and using the so-called Rydberg blockade mechanism. So what happens here is as long as two atoms are moved to, to be neighboring with each other, then they'll be strongly interacting and they'll execute a gate. One important difference from the usual gate schemes that people have is that here, the main, the main aspect of the Rydberg interaction is actually that it's making the doubly excited Rydberg state up here to be kind of energetically disfavored, so you actually never go into the doubly excited state. And so when you think about kind of the actual subspace of evolution, the absolute interaction strength never enters. And so that's why this gate is quite a bit more robust uh, against, say, positional fluctuations or interaction strength fluctuations compared to the typical two qubit gates that you may have heard from, from superconducting or ion trap systems. May yeah. I ask a question? So you talked about calibration. What time scale for calibration are we talking about? Hours, days, months? So, for, for example, for these local single qubit gates, yeah. which is probably the, the most uh, kind of complicated part, um, we typically, so when we first calibrate it, it might take, say, half a day or so. And then once we calibrate that, 
it actually stays pretty stable on, I think, even a month time scale. Um, so there's, there's relatively little drift. There are some slight things that we need to compensate for in terms of like slight field of view shifts due to the thermal reasons. Um, but nowadays, actually, these are also very stable if, if we continuously run. Yeah. Is that a very basic level? Like when you perform a gate, are you like turning on a certain laser that's not normally on, or are you like is it the pulse shape or something like that? That's a great question. Yeah. So, so when we do a gate, so, so I guess first I should, I should also mention that we move the atoms around so that the right atoms to do a two qubit gate are neighboring. And then, for example, if we want to do the CZ gate, what we will actually do is turn on actually two laser beams because of some atomic physics reasons. Um, and these, these two beams basically kind of illuminate this, this entire region here. So all of the qubits in there, as long as they have a neighbor, they'll do a two qubit gate. Um, another feature that we recently implemented is mid-circuit measurement and feed-forward, which is very important also for doing actual quantum computing. Um, for example, you need this for, for T-gate uh, teleportation. Um, and we also are able to achieve uh, on the order of 99.8% readout fidelity for these mid-circuit measurements as well. So we have now a, a pretty nice toolkit with, I, I think, reasonably competitive fidelities and a lot of flexibility. Um, and kind of when this platform was first developed uh, two years ago, um, the first demonstration was essentially preparing the Torah code, but actually on a torus. So in this particular movie, uh, what we're showing here is that uh, you can kind of have these ancilla qubits, which are essentially moving around and doing the Z-stabilizer measurements uh, for, the, for the kind of the Torah code code state. Um, and so this, you can see that these kind of ancillas go from one end of, of the system to the other end, and that's how you're able to implement the periodic boundary conditions for the Torah code. Uh, so taking this a step further, what we've also been developing recently in our experiments at Harvard is really thinking about the full-scale architecture of maybe what an early uh, neutral atom logical quantum processor might look like. So we have different types of zones. We have storage zones where we store the qubits away from some of these gate beams so that we can have long coherence times. We have an entangling zone um, where we do these uh, entangling gates. Um, and then we also have a readout zone for kind of a high-fidelity mid-circuit imaging. In this process, uh, we can also kind of both bring in several different code patches and then interlace them to do a so-called transversal logical entangling gate, where you essentially do a physical C0 between each pair of qubits, and this executes a logical C0 for you, um, a very nice for tolerant gate. Um, we can also bring in ancillas if we want to do kind of rounds of uh, mid-circuit uh, syndrome extraction. Um, and I think a few kind of key things to highlight that really enables this architecture, one is the fact that we can non-locally move these different blocks, which facilitates doing transversal gates here, as opposed to the maybe more standard lattice surgery schemes or braiding schemes that people think about. And another important feature is that we actually are really making use of the fact that we have parallel efficient classical control here. So for example, you'll notice here that these individual logical code blocks that we're storing away, when we want to move them to do a logical entangling gate or a logical syndrome extraction, we actually just have this one block of one beam that kind of goes and grabs this entire logical qubit and brings it in. And so you really have a very high degree of parallelism when you're trying to do these operations, even though we're just using like a handful of control channels. Yes? Did, did you mention like what kind of time skills you can do that movement in? It's around a couple hundred microseconds, maybe 200 microseconds or so. Yeah. And, uh, and you can really move any of them around in the whole kind of grid? Is that? Is yeah, so, so what's particularly natural for us is if you kind of pick up a whole grid of atoms, then you can move that entire grid over to kind of to a certain location. So for example here, if I wanted to pick up one logical qubit, or if I say I wanted to pick up all five of these, then it would also be pretty easy for us to do. Um, if you wanted to do, say, like a fully arbitrary rearrangement, that becomes a little bit more complex. We'll mention some related schemes in the LDPC part where you do need more general kind of connectivity. Um, but if you really wanted fully random 2D permutation, uh, I think you need to add a little bit more optical tools, and then you actually can also get that fairly efficiently. Um, but, but right now, it would be a little bit of a pain. Yeah. Great. Um, so in kind of some of these early experiments that we carried out, um, one particular example is that we tried to prepare surface codes of different sizes. Uh, 
um, encoding them in the plus and zero, do a transversal C0. Um, and then we do indeed see that if we do suitable decoding, um, and this is something that Maddie will also be telling us more about tomorrow, um, we, we, we do indeed see that as we increase the surface code distance, we can see a suppression in error, which is very important and kind of one of the hallmarks of really doing error correction. Um, so following that, we can also go to more logical qubits. Here in particular, we're kind of preparing uh, many copies of the 7.1 free Steam code. Um, and so, for example, this is a movie of, uh, I guess this is an, a more visualization, this particular one. Um, but it's a visualization of how we would kind of prepare many copies of these uh, individual logical code blocks. So you see a lot of repeated patterns. We're kind of moving down, um, moving down. So, so the first kind of step, three steps of rapid moves are preparing uh, essentially the one Steam code non-fault tolerantly. Um, then we move, then we move one of the copies up. You'll see that it kind of stopped very briefly next to the other ones. That's doing fault tolerant state prep. Um, and then we can kind of rinse and repeat and do many more. Um, so we do see a little bit of increase in idle error because we're serializing things. Um, but in the future, I think this is also something that we can pretty easily address by slightly changing some of our addressing schemes. Um, and at the same time, uh, maybe even in the early fault tolerant regime, a trade-off of getting 10 more logical qubits while paying maybe 1% error or so might even be something that you'd be willing to take. So these codes, the surface code and kind of this small uh, instance of a color code, uh, of a 2D color code, um, these are kind of very nice prototypical examples, but they only give you access to uh, kind of Clifford circuit uh, in terms of their transversal gate set. So what we would also like to do is to maybe explore whether we can make use of slightly different types of codes and actually start thinking about slightly more complex quantum circuits at the logical level. So the particular one that we got interested in, and actually Alex Kubica here um, first kind of uh, mentioned this to us, is the so-called 832 code, which is a small 3D color code. Um, so here, what you have is eight physical qubits encoding three logical qubits. The logical x's roughly look like faces, and the z's are kind of perpendicular to them. Um, you can convince yourself that all of the formalism works out. But the really nice thing about this is that even though it's, a red, I guess, in this relatively small code, you actually have a lot of access to different types of gates. So we have a CCZ that is implemented within kind of this eight, one single A32 block um, with, with uh, just single qubit rotations. Also with the CZ, uh, you can kind of gain, get that from the CCZ. Um, you can also have a C0 within the block by permuting some of the qubits. And also if you have two blocks, then you can do a transversal C0 between these two blocks um, and this will implement a logical C0 between kind of each of the corresponding qubits. So this is a pretty nice, uh, not, not universal, of course, but a pretty nice set of transversal gates that we have here. Um, and what we can then think about is really preparing many copies of this and now start executing some pretty complicated looking circuits. So what we're doing here um, is we're preparing uh, the logical qubits in the, essentially the plus state. We then interleave steps of interblock CCZ or CZ gates at the physical level implemented with uh, physical rotations, um, and then, uh, then kind of implementing further interblock C knots so that uh, you can kind of generate further larger scale entanglement. In total, the largest circuit that we ran involves 48 logical qubits on the order of 200 or so logical two qubit gates as well as 48 non Clifford gates. So really, if we were to do a brute force simulation of this, this would actually already be quite challenging. In our particular case, we chose a structure such that it's relatively easy to use kind of a half the system size and then patch together the results. Um, but I think further extensions of this could then start going more towards a, a, a kind of a, a more challenging regime. Yes? What's the total number of physical qubit? Uh, so I guess each one is a free two, so it will be 128 uh, physical qubits, I think, yeah. Um, so this is, this is an actual atom movie of some of the things that we do here. So you see that we first do three steps like that. We're preparing the co-states. This is eight blocks in parallel. Each kind of block of four by two is one logical qubit. We're then kind of moving these different uh, blocks together. We're now swapping in the other 24 logical qubits. Um, and each of those big block movements that you see there, um, these actually kind of correspond in terms of the logical connectivity to growing out a hypercube connectivity. So you're kind of looking essentially 
at a 4D hypercube at the logical level and kind of a 7D hypercube at the physical level. So uh, kind of the circuit that we ran, um, as I mentioned uh, kind of earlier, if you try to sample from this, it's actually, there's actually a known mapping to IQP circuits. And so th there is kind of some potential guarantee at large scale for classical hardness. Um, and in, particular, in, in our particular case, what we were looking at in this particular uh, kind of figure is for each of the bit strings that we observe, what the theoretical probability as well as the experimental observed probability is. And we can really zoom in into kind of the relatively fine uh, small scale features in the larger figure, and you actually still see some reasonable correspondence between those. And so this really seems like our, we really are somewhat sampling from the desired distribution. We can also quantify this a little bit more carefully using this so-called cross-entropy benchmark, which essentially compares the, the kind of the, the similarity between the two distributions. And we see that if we apply more and more error detection, we see a higher fidelity. And if we apply for this 12 logical qubit case, if we apply full error detection post-selection, um, then you'll get a logical XC, normalized XCB uh, of roughly 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. So really a pretty high uh, fidelity overall. Uh, of course, we took this to larger sizes, um, and at the largest scale of 48 logical qubits, where we still tested these XCB metrics, uh, with post-selection, we see a fit logical XCB fidelity of around 10%. Um, and this, in particular, compared to estimations that we did based on our physical implementation fidelity, it actually does seem to show some improvement over, over this. And I think this sampling case is a particular nice case because when you do post-selection, you're really kind of cleaning up and throwing out samples that, that wouldn't be as clean. And so really the error detection here is helping you to do quite a bit better. Uh, on the physics side, um, these, these, these same circuits actually, we can also probe them in a very different and interesting way. Uh, so in particular, uh, Bell basis measurements um, have recently been shown to be a very powerful tool for extracting a lot of very interesting quantum information uh, uh, metrics. So one thing that we can do is to take two copies and interfere it. If you look at subsystems, you can actually probe the entanglement entropy. Um, and so we can kind of look at how scrambling and thermalizing these kind of circuits that we're executing are. You can also look at uh, Bell magic, which is, a, which is one of the metrics that you can use to quantify how much non-cliffordness there is in the circuit that you're running. This was for one of our small scale circuits where it was still pretty kind of tractable to do this. Um, and then finally, you can also actually even extract the absolute value of all four to the 12 Pauli strings by just using these uh, kind of uh, Bell basis readout results. And so this also gives us a very powerful way to really extract a wealth of information, even just from this one set of data. Great. Um, so I've told you a little bit about these different experiments, but I really want to return to kind of this control efficient scheme and try to understand why it is that kind of a relatively small academic lab like ours with maybe five or six people working over a summer on these experiments is really able to execute already these pretty complicated experiments. Um, of course, we had a lot of support from other theorists and people in the community, um, but I think one very important feature is the control aspect. So if we think about a classical computer chip, typically we have billions of transistors, uh, but maybe on the order of a thousand external controls going into these chips. Whereas that's not really what the quantum computers typically look like nowadays, right? Like for, for this uh, particular image from Google, um, you'll see many, many wires for a 50 qubit experiment. But in our case, because of the natural multiplexing afforded to us by these optical tools, actually just a single wire or, or two wires allows us to control an entire grid of qubits. And in particular, if we think about a larger code, now not just distance, three, five, distance 357 or even like distance 20 or so, you could still in principle imagine just having the same number of control channels, but controlling this entire large logical qubit. And so, so really, I think this lends itself well to potentially kind of further expanding the system sizes. Um, and indeed, in the community, uh, we are pretty optimistic that in the next cu coming years, we'll be able to see scales of thousands to maybe even 10,000 uh, qubit, physical qubits being manipulated here. Okay, so I've, I've told you about some of our recent experiments, both on the side of bigger codes, of doing larger code distances, um, as well as running circuits with many logical qubits. Maybe I'll briefly pause here before I move into the second half. Uh, 
Um, so we saw that we can kind of potentially have bigger codes than maybe many logical qubits, but really what we would like to have is both, right? You want both um, many physical and uh, many logical qubits for your operations, as well as a good fidelity, such that when you're actually running these circuits, you have a sufficient error suppression, and that usually comes from having a sufficiently large code distance. Um, so in particular, with this standard NKD notation, uh, we kind of want to have large encoded logical qubits and distance, large KND, but with as small of an N as possible, so that we're not using too much resources. Um, and indeed, in, with just the standard surface code, at the scales that people think we need, you typically need a distance of 30 or so. That means that you need, say, like, like kind of thousands, 1,000 to 2,000 physical qubits, and that's a pretty low encoding rate. And so really, um, it would be nice if we can do better than the surface code. Um, and we've already heard a little bit about this um, also in, in uh, Pavel's uh, previous talk. Um, uh, kind of in 2D local systems, you can't really do much better based on the BPT bound. In particular, the number of logical qubits and the distance actually is constrained with these parameters, and this is actually saturated by the surface code. But with more general connectivities, you can actually construct codes that have better parameters. Um, and in particular, we heard a little bit about these good, LDPC, good quantum LDPC codes in the previous talk. Some of the challenges, though, is that these require substantial non-locality. But as, as we saw earlier already in, in even our earlier experiments, uh, we can actually have a substantial amount of non-locality with these neutral atoms. So we do have non-locality, uh, but does it really work well with this parallel efficient control that we like so much? Um, in particular, uh, if you first just look at it, and maybe if you didn't know too much and just asked Dali to illustrate a quantum LDPC code for you, maybe what you'd get is something like this, where it has kind of weird stuff going everywhere. Um, and this is probably what I would have imagined what an LDPC code looked like before kind of I actually learned a little bit more of the details. Um, and if you have something like this, right, maybe it's not so hardware efficient to implement. In particular, uh, we like to use these crossed AODs for all of our movements. These do have some restrictions. It kind of lives naturally on a 2D grid that you can translate and rescale. Um, but the rows and columns also can't really cross. So there are some constraints that we really need to think, uh, kind of keep in mind that we're doing this. Um, and, and for a generic connectivity, uh, this may not really be satisfied uh, with the types of constructions that you might uh, have with these movements, right? But fortunately, uh, quantum codes often have quite a bit more structure. Um, and in particular, I think a lot of the early work had actually, uh, in particular, uh, Nic uh, Nicola's earlier work, kind of thinking about these in the superconducting qubit context with multi-layers, uh, was actually also partly the inspiration for our work here uh, of really thinking about how, in this case, how can we utilize some of these detailed characteristics of the codes, which kind of, in some sense, are almost necessary when you're trying to construct the quantum code because you need a little bit more structure uh, to satisfy, like, kind of this, uh, like, for example, in the CSS case, these, these kind of regular conditions. Um, and so, so, in particular, the, the structure that we identified being very naturally matching is this so called product structure. Um, so, we heard already an entire talk just now about products, um, but just, just as a very quick review of the basics. Uh, so, a hypergraph product code can be viewed as a quantum code by taking the product between two classical codes. So here, I'm just illustrating it with a surface code, where, where for each of these two classical codes, I have a repetition code of three kind of data bits and then two checks between them, checking the neighboring parity. Uh, if I take the hypergraph product code, then essentially I'll be placing data qubits on the intersection of kind of two bits and two checks, and then z-stabilizers on uh, an intersection of a bit and a check, and an X stabilizer on kind of the other type of intersection. So this is uh, another view of the surface code, but if you put in a different type of code, uh, in particular, if you put in a good classical code, which has a number of uh, logical qubits as well as code distance scaling linearly with the number of uh, physical qubits, then you obtain a quantum code that still has this square root n uh, distance scaling but now instead of encoding just one logical qubit, you can encode a linear number of logical qubits. Uh, so this already is a great improvement in the parameters. Um, if you put in <clears throat> kind of a classical expander code, then this is also known as the quantum expander code. Um, and the same idea was kind of the basic foundation of a lot of the subsequent ideas that came uh, in terms of lifted products or balanced products um, and other good codes. So you might already uh, have, have realized that this product 
uh, word that we're saying there is very similar to kind of the product that you have in these cross DODs. In particular, if we can do row permutations followed by column permutations, because the connectivity of this hypergraph product code is completely inherited from the underlying classical codes, you're actually doing the same thing in all of the horizontal, in all of the kind of different columns, as well as all of the different rows. Um, and so you actually will end up being able to implement this in a very nice and parallel fashion. Um, we can also adapt these schemes a little bit to, for example, the lifted product code. Some of the things are slightly less elegant, um, but nonetheless, there are still ways to do it, and there probably are better ways to do it, utilizing some of the symmetries there as well. So the particular classical codes that we, that we decided to use, uh, following a lot of the literature, um, is simply just a random free fold by regular graph, where each of the classical bits is connected uh, to kind of uh, free checks, and each of the checks is connected to free, uh, four bits. Um, this, if you, if you kind of uh, look asymptotically, people know that this actually does generate uh, kind of good classical codes. I mean, in our particular case, we basically just generated a bunch of examples and optimized over them. However, these classical codes, these are pretty, basically pretty random connectivities. So we still need to be able to do basically arbitrary rearrangements in 1D. Um, Fortunately, that's actually not too difficult to do in a relatively efficient fashion. So the essential idea is that we identify the mapping that we want from one layer to the next. This essentially corresponds to a permutation of the qubits in one dimension. Um, and by doing this simple algorithm, where we take all of the qubits that need to land on the right side, or pull them out to the right, and then kind of compact the workspace a little bit so that we can then do recursive layers of the same thing, you can actually have a log depth algorithm to implement an arbitrary 1D permutation. Um, and in, in practice, if you look at particular instances, uh, we've also been working with uh, Daniel and Jason here from UCLA, um, you can see that you can actually further optimize the number of moves that you need for, for particular instances. So this is kind of an upper bound if you wanted to implement an ar kind of an arbitrary permutation. Uh, so we can kind of visualize what this might look like. So here, we're first just doing this log depth rearrangement, we've kind of partitioned it into half, and then we're going to be doing the same thing in smaller groups. Then we flash this global entangling light that does the CZ, uh, C0 gates between all of the pairs, um, and then we can follow it with the next round of uh, rearrangement. Um, this particular circuit actually is also very nicely uh, fault tolerant, even with just a single ancilla for the syndrome extraction, which is a very nice feature um, because as we as we kind of uh, think about the circuit level distance, we actually will pretty much preserve that. Um, so we can then kind of move on to the vertical direction um, and finish off all round of syndrome extraction. So uh, based on this, uh, we ran some evaluations of the circuit level performance. Um, these simulations in particular were spearheaded by Tian uh, and Pablo. Um, and what we did here was that we did decoding uh, kind of with this more space-time perspectives so that we could decode with multiple rounds at the same time. Um, so here what we do in these memory experiments is that we run belief propagation, one of the kind of uh, standard message passing algorithms that is also used for classical LDPC codes uh, during these kind of uh, intermediate rounds. And then for the final round, uh, we applied BP plus some uh, ordered, statistics, uh, ordered statistics decoding post-processing so that we can project back into the code space um, and that helps improve the performance. Uh, with the circuit level simulations, we found that if we first use a circuit level depolarizing noise that for, for the moment being just ignores the idling errors, then you see roughly an error threshold of around 0.6% compared to somewhere close to 1% for the surface code in a similar error, error model. Um, so this is a little bit lower, but still reasonably competitive. Um, and also, because the neutral atoms have relatively long coherence times, if we assume the coherence times that have been demonstrated in the community, um, and then kind of correspondingly, as we go to lower error rates, assume similar performances as we scale, we see that this actually adds in relatively little idling errors. Um, and so kind of if we can do the decoupling well enough, then we do expect to recover most of this relatively high threshold for the gates that we saw. Uh, we can also take a, more, take a closer look at the actual overheads. So here in these uh, calculations, we included both the hypergraph products as well as the lifted products, which for the relatively small sizes where we could directly simulate, have a better guarantee in terms of some of the code parameters. And we see that 
these LDPC codes, um, they can really start having some benefits even at the relatively modest size of several hundred physical qubits. Um, so here, for example, uh, in this particular case, uh, we have uh, around 100 logical qubits, around 2,000 or so physical qubits with an error rate of maybe 10 to the minus 5 or, five or yeah, 10 to the minus 5 or so. Um, and you already see that there's actually a kind of a, 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 around an order of magnitude difference between, the, between kind of the resources used by the surface code um, and the resources used by our construction. Um, and so you can really get a pretty large saving. And in particular, now as we think about larger scale computations, for example, if we wanted to have a thousand logical qubit computation, you could really imagine now start maybe packing this into order of 100,000 physical qubits. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these scales now are starting to kind of bridge up and approach the scales that people are hoping to get to at the kind of the, the physical level in these neutral atom platforms in the next couple of years as well. Um, so really it seems that some of at least the numbers maybe aren't so crazy as one might have uh, previously thought. And also I should also highlight that there's a lot of other features that you could hope to utilize. There's a lot of work going on in the community with bias noise, with erasure channels. Um, these will of course further bring down these costs. Um, and so, so uh, it, it, it seems like it's, there's, there's a potential path towards getting to these larger scales. Uh, but of course, those simulations that I've showed you are still primarily memory. Um, and that's not really the, the, the main reason that we're interested in quantum computing, right? We really want to be executing an actual computation. Um, and so this is actually not so easy in the LDPC case, because each kind of block is really encoding many logical qubits. And sometimes it's maybe not so obvious how you disentangle one of the logical qubits to do just an operation on there without affecting in some way all of the other logical qubits. So, so really being able to selectively apply these gates is something that we need to develop. Um, fortunately, there's already been a little bit of thinking in the community. For example, uh, in the last two, two years or so, people have been proposing different types of fault transversal gates. Um, people have also been thinking about various constructions that generalize lattice surgery to this setting. Um, and what we came up with is a very similar scheme to this uh, Cohen et al. lattice surgery scheme, but with some slight modifications, uh, particularly purposed towards uh, the particular scheme that we're thinking just as a starting point to do the computation. So in, in this particular case, what we're doing is that we're using kind of an ancilla patch that I'll describe in a little bit more detail in a moment to teleport the logical qubits out into a surface code and then kind of temporarily use the surface code for computation before putting it back in. Uh, of course, I think in the longer run, it's probably better if people can come up with better techniques for doing this, maybe more directly on the LDPC codes. Uh, this, this previous proposal actually does to some degree do that, um, but there are still various other features that you might desire a little bit more uh, in, in these schemes that, are, that currently exist. Uh, <coughs> So before describing our scheme, I'll maybe just give a very quick review of lattice surgery for those who maybe ha aren't so familiar with it. So lattice surgery works um, by essentially having, so in this particular case, I'm illustrating with the surface code. So I have two Z logicals running vertically where these dark plaquettes are the X stabilizers and these light ones are the Z stabilizers. If I then start measuring stabilizers in between and merging these two code patches, um, I'll see that the, the product of this newly added stabilizer patch and this one actually precisely corresponds to the product of the two Z logicals. Um, so this gives us a way to very nicely extract this joint ZZ. You do actually need D rounds to enable for tolerance in this particular setting. Um, uh, and in our particular case, we'll basically be using the same idea, um, except here first we'll, so we construct an ancilla patch from the hypergraph product of two objects. The first one is essentially the logical operator that we're interested in in the LDPC code together with the checks in this column that are associated with it. Um, and then the other side, we take the repetition code, which is kind of the boundary of the surface code. And so then what we can do is um, we basically kind of first do a joint XX measurement between the ancilla and the LDPC patch. Then we do the same with the surface code. Um, and that allows us to kind of do teleportation in and out. Uh, so we also carried out circuit level simulations of this. Um, to our knowledge, this is kind of the, the first one where you actually examine the circuit level performance of such a protocol. 
Um, and encouragingly, we see that actually the threshold and error rates that we see are somewhat comparable uh, to, to the ones that we observed uh, uh, kind of back in the memory setting. Um, so this gives some confidence that maybe with these, uh, with these, um, with these kind of codes, uh, you can really still maintain some of the advantages in terms of the logical error rates, in terms of the encoding code parameters, while you're still doing computation. Um, and I think in the future, of course, uh, right now we're just applying this kind of generic BP plus OSD decoder to it, wherein uh, we're, we're still kind of joining together the information from multiple rounds, but in particular these surface codes, of course, there's much better decoders for it. Um, this kind of hybrid ancilla patch it has some features of the original LDPC code, but maybe also not entirely. And so I think there's a lot of work that could be done also to further improve the decoders um, and, and optimize the, the performance in some of these settings. Uh, so with that, uh, I've told you a little bit about some of our recent progress in our, in our community, um, both in terms of what we can do today with these early fault-tolerant logical quantum processors, exploring some of the early algorithms, and maybe starting to think about how, with these current resources, uh, we can really think about executing uh, kind of small-scale quantum circuits with logical qubits, um, and kind of gradually learning more about some of the opportunities and challenges as we start using logical qubits uh, for these different systems. Um, I've then told you also a little bit about some of our recent work towards really thinking on the architectural side about how some of these same tools, particularly on the control side, um, on these control efficient aspects, can really enabled, uh, enable also new capabilities with tomorrow's quantum processors and potentially reduce the overhead that we need for executing large scale computations. Um, and I think looking forward, there's a lot of interplay really that we can think about and see um, going forward, so for example, uh, a lot of the A32 work can really be thought of as co-designing some of the codes and the gates. And I think taking this further, maybe you could also imagine thinking about different types of algorithmic gadgets that you might care about, and really thinking about how you can also co-design some aspects of that. Um, I briefly mentioned a lot of our kind of philosophy of control efficiency, but also there's other aspects of hardware efficient design, uh, including uh, bias noise, erasure, um, a lot of these other things that really match the capabilities of the error correcting code to your native hardware capabilities. And also as we now start looking at kind of slightly more moderate sized computations, things like the actual layout of these uh, kind of logical qubits that we have there to both maximally utilize the native hardware capabilities and this control parallelism, as well as think about other aspects of these, I think we'll increasingly also see more and more kind of synergy between the algorithmic layout and kind of space-time optimization. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators. Um, this is kind of the group of people who are involved in this LDPC project. I'll particularly highlight Tian and Pablo, uh, who really spearheaded a lot of the hard work on the numeric side. Um, and then also on the, on the kind of logical algorithms experiment, it was an even uh, larger team. Um, a lot of people at Harvard, uh, some of the FPGA work at Quera, um, as well as many theory collaborators. Um, and Maddie is also here and will be telling us more about some of the interesting decoding things that we had to do to really enable some of these experiments tomorrow. Um, so with that, thank you for your attention um, and happy to take questions.